Hello, my name is Peter Rosenbaum, and I have the opportunity to do a podcast on a recent editorial, June 2022, on the question of whether cerebral palsy is progressive. This, as I note in the editorial, is a perennial question and is often used as an exclusion criterion to rule out cerebral palsy when we know a child has impairments that are associated with recognized progressive conditions such as neurodegenerative disorders or Duchenne muscular dystrophy as examples. The question really is whether we can understand the biology underlying cerebral palsy. And it's important to state off the top that cerebral palsy is not a single condition. Uh, it is due to a host of underlying biological impairments in brain function and structure that manifest with relatively similar and relatively common phenotypes. At the biological level, it is really important to understand whether conditions traditionally accepted in the mainstream of cerebral palsy still have underlying biological, biomedical, uh, pathophysiological uh, impairments that are slowly progressive and that are harder to recognize than, say, Tay-Sachs disease or leukodystrophies. At the clinical level, at the experiential level, children with cerebral palsy change, develop, and in quotes, progress. And that is what we celebrate in child development. So that even in the face of impairments in motor control and possibly other uh, functional aspects of life, children with cerebral palsy change and develop. I think one of the biggest challenges we have is to understand what factors are contributing to change, be it positive change or in fact, loss of function. So we know, for example, that adults with cerebral palsy often have some loss of function over time, as do I without cerebral palsy. So can we untangle what is going on in the lives of people whose function is less good over time? And are there palpable, observable, identifiable, and quite frankly, preventable and treatable impairments that we can understand as part of the biology of the cerebral palsies? I think that researchers have an enormous challenge and opportunity to try to understand the biology and the pathophysiology of cerebral palsy over time with serial studies of the same people. Clearly, we need longitudinal studies that look at the same people over time and can try to disentangle the factors that are contributing to changes in people's lives. The whole premise of my article was to remind us that, as usual, the question is cerebral palsy progressive depends upon who is asking and what they really mean. I would encourage people to think about these questions broadly in terms of functional progression, biomedical progression, personal progression, and so on, and to recognize that the answer is it depends. Thanks very much for listening.